Welcome back to the Winter Growers Podcast. In this episode, I had the pleasure of speaking with Jamila Norman of Patchwork City Farms in Atlanta, Georgia. Jamila is a first-generation daughter to Caribbean parents whose history is rooted in agriculture. After a career in environmental engineering, she founded Patchwork City Farms in 2010, which is an acre and a quarter urban farm with one 30 by 96 high tunnel and four caterpillar tunnels that supplies two farmers markets, local restaurants, and a farm stand launching this year. I reached out to Jamila in January after an Arctic blast with lows in the teens hit Atlanta and decimated 90% of her winter crops and severely impacted local winter crop availability. I wanted to see if I could offer any help or suggestions for preparing for future extreme cold weather events not normally experienced in Atlanta. But what I learned from Jamila is just how difficult it is to prepare for extreme, unpredictable cold unless adequate infrastructure like high tunnels are already in use, which are not typically needed for growing cold hardy crops in the South. We also talk about her gardening television series that she hosts called Homegrown on Magnolia Network which just launched its third season. The series focuses on helping families in the Atlanta area transform their outdoor spaces into beautiful and functional backyard farms, and it can be streamed on HBO Max. Jamila is a warm-hearted leader and a resource for the urban farming community, and I truly enjoyed our conversation. This episode of the Winter Growers Podcast is brought to you by Vermont Compost Company. Since 1993, Vermont Compost Company has grown from a small local operation to a company supplying premium living soils to thousands of successful growers all over the country. Combining meticulously crafted compost with intentional sourcing of the highest quality materials and amendments, Vermont Compost Company consistently delivers organic growers the soils their businesses depend on. In addition to product consistency, growers can count on Vermont Compost to provide the technical expertise it takes to make your organic farm flourish. Visit vermontcompost.com to learn more. Why grow alone? This episode is also brought to you by Seed Time. Have you ever struggled with the timing of winter crops and planning your succession plantings? I've been playing around with a new crop planner called Seed Time that makes it so incredibly easy for home gardeners and market farmers alike to visualize when to seed, transplant, harvest, and more all year round. If you'd like to save a ton of time and avoid headaches planning and growing your crops, get your free Seed Time account with a $5 free seed coupon at seedtime.us forward slash no till podcast. That's seedtime.us slash no-till podcast. All right. Enjoy the show. Okay. So welcome to Jamila. Uh, This is the Winter Growers Podcast. Thank you so much for being here. Yeah. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Good. Well, I uh, first reached out to you. It was January of this year. There happened to be a very difficult and challenging event, weather event down in Georgia and actually a lot over a lot of the Northeast. Uh, But Georgia being, you know, relatively mild for winters, this was not something that you had anticipated um, or experienced much. Um, So as, you know, someone who's growing year round, this was a bit of a, uh (laughs) uh-oh, what do we do next kind of moment. And I was really curious sort of about, um, you know, how, how do farmers, especially down in Georgia and Southern, you know, latitudes, how do they mitigate these climatic changes and events um, in order to supply fresh produce to your community? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You definitely reached out. It was a very um, record-setting time in Georgia. Um, I've been growing in Atlanta, Georgia for going on 14 years. And um, yeah, temperatures generally, you know, they'll get down to, you know, 30s. They'll get down to the 20s. Um, And generally, it just sort of dips and then goes back up. Um, but this event was sustained um, 
think it was like 10, but the wind, and it was also very windy. So the windshield factor was like negative 10 and it was like sustained for like days. Um, and so this was <clears throat> not weather we had experienced ever in the South. And um, it was across the whole state and just a lot in the Southeast. So it wasn't even just sort of like regional. So North Georgia, South Georgia, Atlanta's kind of, you know, middle. And uh, yeah, just on a whole, um, you know, the governor declared a state of emergency. And um, yeah, it's nothing, it's nothing any of us prepared for, right? Because this is not what we expect. This is not our normal season and seasonal pattern. And um, it was just, just, we just got hit. Um, and so we're all just really, you know, we're recovering from it. Um, all the crops that we had, that we had in our, we had crops in the tunnel, we had crops out in the field, everything was covered as best we could with, um, we had low tunnels covering, I would say, probably 50% of the growing space. Um, and then I had uh, one really large tunnel and four caterpillar tunnels covering other spaces. Um, and uh, we pretty much lost, I think like 85, 90% of our crops. Um, and we grow through the winter and were attending local farmers markets, everything like that. So it was a significant loss across the state. Um, but, you know, you get to learn what makes it. <laughs> you get to learn what survives and um and yeah we have to just sort of think and plan for that in the future yeah no definitely and i think what you know is really interesting for me is you know farming and growing and obviously predictable winter climates we tend to prepare for all these events or we have um you know the expectation that the plants will be able to harden off going into the winter you know because we have more predictable cold mm -hmm. uh but then you know here is the situation where it really just hit you out of the blue and mm -hmm. um how do you prepare for things like that that was sort of my you know suddenly like i was like oh right i thought it was so difficult up here in maine <laughs> but that's a significant yeah. challenge that is really difficult to prepare for um even if you have a couple days ahead of time notice that it's coming there's not a lot you yeah. can do i mean you can't just suddenly erect a high tunnel over those crops so mm -hmm. yeah yeah yeah, yeah, and you're right. I mean, exactly. You 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 can't really prepare for that because this is not normal. This is not seasonal. And, you know, like all of us, you know, we kind of knew it was coming in the sense of like a couple of days. But, you know, all you really have is what you have. Like, even if you try to get a hot tunnel, it wouldn't you wouldn't order it fast enough, get it in fast enough, cover, you know. So it's not something you can just pivot on a dime to adjust for um, something, you know, that crazy. And so with everything that we did with, you know, having all of our tunnels closed. I mean, the windshield factor, I think, is what really just kind of took it over the edge because the wind just sort of came in and blew under the tunnels. And I mean, in Georgia, we all, for the most part, do unheated. You know, we're not, we don't have any heating in our tunnels. It's just enough to keep the chill off and the plants just make it. Um, uh, but yeah, you know, the only things that survived were pearly kale, purple and green, um, collards, collards survived. And I mean, even those plants, they survived, but like the bigger leaves, I mean, we were like, you know, getting ready to harvest, going to market. Um, you definitely had to pull off the the bigger leaves cause they kind of got burnt and, and yellowed and, um, and then had to just kind of give them a couple of weeks to kind of come back, you know, to their full selves. Um, spinach and, purple lettuce all the other lettuces we had romains we had um a couple of different uh like a panisse type oak leaf lettuce um a curly green so all of the green lettuces did not make it the um purple kale um the purple lettuce that we had i can't remember what the variety was that one survived so it's like okay <laughs> purple um leeks we had leeks in the ground so the leeks um managed and they were yeah, the leaks were covered in low tunnels. Strawberries survived, and I just like did not have enough um, low low tunnel um, fabric to cover up the strawberries. So it was just kind of like, if you make it, you make it. And uh, yeah, strawberries are a trooper. They they were like, we're we're an alpine crop. We're gonna hang in there. And so um, so that's good because people love strawberries in the um, in the springtime. Um, and so yeah, so the planning for something like that is. What do I, how do I plan next year? It's not in the moment, you know? Um, 
And that's just sort of the new normal is unpredictability. We just came out of 80 degrees two days ago, two, three days ago, and it's going to be below freezing this evening. And so Georgia is like those crazy swings. Plants are about to bolt. Plants are about to freeze. Plants are about to bolt. Plants are about to freeze. And just so listeners know, we're recording this on March 12th to give you a general frame of reference that that's a huge swing, um, yeah. you know, and still early spring. Yeah, it's so. a huge swing. Everything has blossomed in the South, which we're all, as farmers, very concerned. And we're like, this is not okay. And of course, the public is like, oh, it's so lovely. Look, the trees are on Lake. We're going to lose. I think for the last couple of years, the state has lost like 50% of its um, peach crop. They've lost like significant um, percentages of their um, apples um, in North Georgia because things are blooming really early when it gets super warm in February. Um, We're still due in Atlanta. Our last freeze is really not until end of April. Um, Second to last week in April is really when, you know, historically we'll have our last freeze. So we still got a significant time left for some freezes. And yeah, this evening's going to get down to 30 and um, tomorrow. So two days where it's going to get below 30. Um, And it's not going to be good for those crops because, you know, it just kills off those blooms. And that means, you know, less fruit. Uh, So, yeah, you know, everywhere's it's the new normal. Um, We just got to figure out, you know, what will make it, you know, how we adjust. And uh, and that's it. But, yeah, it's more planning for the future than it is in the moment. Yeah. And um, your community came out, uh, you know, really strong and supported you through this um, crisis. And, you know, I guess luckily we do have strong communities that recognize, you know, these challenges and can support um, us mm-hmm. as farmers to get through these events. Uh, what was the most surprising for you about that support? Um, yeah, no, yeah. The community came out. I, you know, I, I did, a, I shared the journey, like of like, what you know, usually, I mean, we, we experienced crop loss, just, you know, all kinds of bugs came and got it. I don't know, you know, a flood came just like regular things in the course of farming. And I don't share that necessarily all the time. Cause I'm just like, <laughs> you know, it's going to be a story every day <laughs> with something. Um, but this one was just significant enough in the way where people were not going to see us at market. And they were going to like significant be like, Jamila is not here for the next month, two months. Like, what's going on? So I was like, well, let me let them know what's going on. And, you know, um, and then so, of course, people, t- can we come help? Of course, everyone wants to come help on the farm. I'm like, well, we got to wait for the, we got to order up more plants because not only that our farms freeze, but our greenhouses, like their pipes froze. So they were down. Anything that had in the greenhouse went down. So everybody, like the whole system, you know, was affected just across the board. Um, and then, you know, but then people were like financially just like supported. And I was blown away by like how many people like were willing to donate, you know, dollars and funds to just be like, whatever you need, you know, however we can support you. So that was really encouraging. Um, and then we joined forces with a couple of other organizations that, you know, I'm on the board of to just kind of raise money for farmers in general around the state, you know, because I'm like, hey, guys, this is not just me going through this. This is literally the state of Georgia and all the farmers across the state. So that was really, really good to see that, you know. And how much, um, yeah, yeah, how much so, does your business depend on the winter sales? Um, what what does that look like for you? I mean, you know, winter sales, I would say would be a quarter of our sales. Um, you know, it it's enough to keep our employees going um, and, and so that they don't have to find seasonal work in the wintertime. Um, and, you know, it keeps your customers engaged because, you know, the thing that I've realized over the years is like when you have those breaks in sales and you kind of lose them, you got to work really hard to kind of Hey guys, get back in there for the springtime. So it, it's significant. And also it's not even just sort of like the winter sales that were lost. It's the crops that we had growing that we were going to be bringing to market in the spring. You know what I mean? So all the broccoli, all the um, cauliflower, all the cabbages and can't really replant it right now. You know, I'm only working on an acre and a half. So Space is very, like, you know, 
it's a little it's a little puzzle, you know, like something occupies space. But as soon as that comes out, it's time for the next thing. So, you know, waiting six weeks to get more, you know, transplants and then getting them in the ground. But you're planting them when it's cold. So not growing that fast. It's like it would take up it would be in the ground too long. And at that point, I really need to start putting in my other crops. So it's just a loss. It's just you're just like, we won't have that crop this year, you know, Um, and I specifically specifically from last year, from the year before, knew that like cauliflower was a little extra sensitive to cold. And so I was like, <laughs> putting it in the high tunnel. Like, I know I'm going to do that. You know what I mean? Like, I was like, I'll protect you this year. And then this thing came and was like, nobody gets to make it. Okay. Um, so, yeah. But it, it it's also kind of saying, I'm like, I might just not grow cauliflower. Like broccoli is, is a workhorse. It's like, I'm, I might just have to let go of cauliflower, you know, and cabbage, which is, you know, whatever. <laughs> We're always adjusting. So uh, maybe you could describe for listeners the layout of your farm, uh, you know, where it's located, sort of this, mm-hmm. the general uh, layout, you know, infrastructure, those kind of details. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I operate um, Patrick City Farms. We are right in the city of Atlanta, like city of Atlanta proper. Like we're about five to six minutes from downtown Atlanta um, in a quadrant of Atlanta, you know, term Southwest Atlanta. So we're literally right in a neighborhood surrounded by single family homes um, in that same community. We're also a lot of our uh, nature preserves and My main site is an acre and a half, and then I partnered with an organization at the adjacent nature preserve, and I'm stewarding a half acre on their site as well. So it's kind of two locations that I'm farming at, and they're like a minute or two from each other, you know, like driving. Um, We have um, one really large 30 foot by 96 foot tunnel, um, high tunnel. Uh, half of the farm space is really long wooden raised beds. Um, so they're like between 90 to 70 feet long, um, foot and a half deep wooden raised beds. And then sort of, then we have a processing area in the middle with two different temperature walk-in coolers, covered processing area where we're bunching, bagging, washing, you know, we have a couple of, um, sinks, wash table. We have a a salad green spinner, you know, the old washing machine salad green spinner and a big bubbler, 111 gallon tank, um, 110 gallon tank uh, greens bubbler. And then the other side of that, um, two caterpillar tunnels, 40 foot, and they have four wooden raised beds in those 40 feet long. And then outside of that, about 24 40 foot raised beds um, as well. Um, And then we have sort of what we call the field on the other side of the farm. And that's probably like a quarter acre field. And we do a lot of field crops. We're just like in ground, you know, till it up. I'll do flowers, pumpkins, just like the things where you're like, you put it out there and, you know, you let it do what it do. Um, And then at the partner site, we have two 50 foot caterpillar tunnels. um, And then probably another 20 in-ground raised beds, um, in-ground beds as well. And those are sort of like permanent beds. So we don't like retail the whole area all the time. The only place we sort of retail on a consistent basis is the open field on the main site. Um, and yeah, so we're really close to our markets. I mean, our the farmer's markets that we go to are like 10 minutes. You know, we go to two farmer's markets. On Saturdays, we do online sales um, and people pick up on the farm on Fridays. Um, We'll be launching an on-site farm stand this year um, on the farm and do that on Fridays as well. And um, yeah, and when we're fully operational, we usually have three people um, working full time at the farm. And then I kind of, you know, step in and out as needed. And I always am there at least for... Thursdays, Fridays, harvest days, um, and then just kind of, you know, touching with the team um, as needed throughout the week. Do you live on site or next door to any of the locations or? No, I live in the neighborhood, but no, these are just 
standalone, separate. Yeah, I live like five minutes from the farm. Most of the people live really close to the farm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do you, I guess, I always am curious if uh, you, do you like that separation? <laughs> yes, I do. I do like that separation. Okay, good. It, I mean, there's as much separation as there can be, you know, because I receive all the packages <laughs> at the house and this is that and the other. Um, city of Atlanta, because it's a city, city of Atlanta, they have old rules that remained on the books kind of back from when, you know, it was a lot of agriculture in the city. But from a development standpoint, if it doesn't have a house on it, it's an empty property. You have a whole farm operation. They've changed the rules. They've adopted farm. So it's considered vacant property, even though there's a whole farm operating on it. And so with that, with vacant property, it makes it really hard to get an address. It makes it hard to just get services because in everybody's, you know, like when I try to get internet out there, they're like, oh, you're not in the system. You know, like it's just, so things like that is just kind of really hard. So right now we still can't receive packages on the farm because it's not really an address. So everything comes to my house. But what's really good is because you're in the city, people do love to just show up. They're like, oh, it's a community garden. Oh, look at this farm. And they just walk in and just walk up and they will come, you know, just meander. And this was long before I even had the show, you know, that kind of actually brought some more attention just in general. Like that's. People see a garden in the city, they see a farm in the city, and they're just like, hey, botanical gardens, I'm going to walk through. So, yeah, so it's nice not to have my home there. So you started the farm 14 years ago, is that correct? Mm-hmm. And what what were your influences um, growing up? What, you know, talk a little bit about your background. I'm curious. Um, yeah, what made you want to be a farmer? I know, right? Um, <laughs> so... My family's Caribbean. My mom is from Jamaica. My dad is from Trinidad. You know, they met each other in New York. I was born and raised in New York. Um, And, you know, they just were like, oh, we're tired of the city. You know, we want to move to the country. And, you know, Atlanta was advertising, come to to Atlanta. Atlanta's, you know, a great mecca for, you know, people of color and just for whatever. And, you know, you can get land and a house. So, you know, we moved down to Georgia And um, just like personally me growing up, I was always just drawn to the outdoors, drawn to nature, just wanting to, you know, that just was just my disposition. You know, I wanted to be an environmental scientist. I (laughs) wanted to join Greenpeace. I wanted to save the world. You know, that was Jamila. And, um, and, you know, and then my parents always, you know, talked about their upbringing, their rich history of agriculture. They grew up in small rural communities in their respective countries. So they're not from the city. They're from tiny towns, you know, and it was all agricultural and everything. You know, my mom would say, everything we ate came from the (laughs) land. We was organic before organic was a thing. And, you know, you're right, because that's just how everybody grew. Um, And so, hold on, I'm plugging in just so I do not lose power (laughs) while we're talking. And um, and so moving to Georgia, I personally knew that I wanted to kind of live in a way where I was like kind of living off the land, you know, kind of like a little bit homesteady, but not totally homestead because I'm a city girl and I love the city. So <laughs> and I was like, how can I live in a city but off the grid? That was like, you know, back to mind. Um, and so, you know, went to school, became an engineer, worked in environmental engineering and just saw the effect of agriculture just kind of like on the environment, um, agricultural practices. You know, Georgia is good old regular standard ag. You know, it's not a very sort of sustainable um, ag environment in terms. It's the biggest industry in Georgia, but, you know, that's not their focus, really. Um as an industry and um, just also seeing the effects of environmental degradation on certain communities. So I lived in Southwest Atlanta. It's historically black community. Um, And I just was like, there's also food disparities, there's food issues, there's health issues. I'm like, no, start a farm in the city, in the community that needs it. And it's going to, you know, it's going to provide food. It's going to bring back, you know, biodiversity, create pollinator habitat, help clean out the air. You know, I thought it was such a cute little idea and a simple solution to, you know, all the problems, right? It's going to solve all the problems. Um, But yeah, but that really was sort of, you know, my 
reason for kind of starting. You know, I have a family. I was raising a family. They were in school. There's just not really good food options here. Just wanted to be part of the solution. You know, like I, I, I'm not going to complain about things. I'm not going to look to government, change stuff. What can I do? And there was a, just a lot of land available in this community and a lot of vacant properties in this community. So, yeah. So when I started, I started with another business partner of mine and her family. It's kind of the same journey, but they're from Kenya. Our family came here from Kenya. So kind of like that same, you know, origin story. Like, oh, you know, we grew up on the land, blah, 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 came here. Um, and her, you know, wanted to kind of get back to that agrarian um, lifestyle. And we started with a lease from Atlanta Public School <laughs> at a middle school. So the first farm site was property. We were leasing an acre from the school system at a work in middle school. And we operated sort of half of it as our commercial operation. The other half was a like community garden, community orchard. And then we had a student garden where we were working with the students after school and, you know, having them grow their stuff. They would come to market with us. We're like, we're going to show you the whole thing. Um, and did that for four years. Gentrification, all kinds of nonsense happened. We lost that lease. And then I moved on to another property with another nonprofit through an MOU. That didn't work out so well. And so I actually had a pause for about a year and a half in farming mm -hmm. while I was looking for land. And I was like, the only way I'm going to continue this and able to continue this is if I own the property. That takes us to the property that I'm on now that I was able to purchase in 2016 in the city of Atlanta before everybody found out that they should buy land <laughs> in Atlanta. So it was a good deal. And they don't exist anymore. Oh my God, it was so lucky. And I'm so thankful for it. And and what um give me a, just a sort of general ballpark idea of what that cost to to purchase that land. What was that? It was eighteen thousand dollars. Okay, yeah. So like, there you go. <laughs> like not a deal anyone would find right now. It was um and it's interesting because it it's I just it was a good people like how did you Google? I just Google land for sale in Atlanta. Literally, that's what I Googled. Um, looked at some other properties, and I just knew like I was like okay. Can't take out a loan. I mean, I just couldn't take out a loan. Um, and this has to be what I can afford. And um, when I tell you the heavens opened up and all kinds of things happened for this to, I just was like, this must be, this has to be. The IRS sent me a check. They were like, oh, we owe you some money. Just out of nowhere. So like that check came in. I stopped working at the state. So I cashed out my retirement at the state, <laughs> which I was like, golly, I went free off for 10 years and this is all we got. I'm cashing it out. I'm buying land. Um, and, you know, and just a couple of other things. And it just was like, it's like $15,000, like cash. And then found this property and we put it on the contract like really quick. And then like maybe like three or four days later, they started getting a lot of inquiries, but thankfully it was already under contract. And, um, and yeah, we closed the deal and oh my God. And it was five minutes from my house. It was already cleared. It was a big corner lot. I was like, and it had what I thought was like a creek in the middle. It's not a creek. It's a drainage ditch that the city dug. And it's been the bane of my existence. But nonetheless, it is it is beautiful. <laughs> You're like, look at this. It's so cute with a creek in the middle. <laughs> uh, so it just was like ideally. And I'm so thankful. Oh, my God. I'm so thankful I had that. <laughs> Lord have mercy. Yeah. And what did it look like to, to start building out the farm at that point? Um, you know, you know, obviously there's a lot of work involved in setting up a farm. So yeah, there is a lot of work. I know. And this was, yeah. this is literally my third time. Right. And every time that I have built a farm, it's like, here's a patch of grass, <laughs> go forth and farm, you know? And so like, yeah, you got to bring in electricity. You got to bring in all the infrastructure, you know, working with USA. So it's like, yeah, you know, it's still being built. Right. You know, we've gotten to the point where, you know, we have, cooler processing, but it's crude. I mean, it's like two shipping containers with a covering, you know, between the two. And that's where our processing happens underneath. You know, we have our walk-in coolers, you know, we got electricity, we got USDA to bring in, you know, dig a well. We have irrigation on like, um, on uh, the main site, we have irrigation on like 70%. So I got to put irrigation in on the other side, um, like drip, drip lines and everything like that. Um, and then the site around the corner, we got those caterpillar tunnels in 
last year. And then we're going to get irrigation put in. And so right now, you know, we're just doing like sprinkler and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, you know, and and I'm funding all this, you know, personally, you know, there are some kind of small grants in the area that we've been able to tap into. The good thing about Atlanta is that there are, there's been a, a support network of nonprofits that have come in and are able to get big donations, you know, from foundations. And they have been able to re-grant those dollars to not just nonprofit firms, but they also are invested in for-profit firms as well. And that really sort of opened it up for us to kind of get the infrastructure that we need um, to run our farms, which has been a lifesaver. Yeah. And you are selling at farmers markets um, online and a couple restaurants here and there. What what motivated the decision to do more retail focus? Really, COVID. Right? Yeah, <laughs> it, it kind of changed the game for everybody. Um, but no, I mean, from day one, in terms of like when I started the farm, I, you know, I'm an engineer so, and, and I love data, so I researched. I was research, researching and reading about building a farm before I even like did this farm, right? Because like I said, I just thought this was going to be something I did in retirement. I didn't think this was going to be like my (laughs) career now. And I probably would retire still farming. Um, So I'm like, yeah, when I get older, I'm going to have a farm, you know, I'm just going to read about it and ingest information. Um, And so I had already kind of been researching like what other sort of production farmers are doing where are they selling? Like, you know, what is the best opportunity for sales? And, you know, people are like, yeah, you know, you find your local farmer's markets and do some restaurant sales and things like that. COVID pushed us online where I don't know why as farmers, we thought we couldn't sell <laughs> vegetables online and we were just so against it. <laughs> it's like, why didn't we do this earlier? Um, but, you know, just kind of like, you just have to pivot, right? And that was sort of, you know, we we thankfully in Atlanta were able to petition the city to get local farms to be considered central businesses so we can continue to operate. So I was able to continue to run the farm through COVID. It's five minutes down the street. I just leave my house, go to the farm. Um, and then, you know, the farmers markets were able to continue to operate. You know, they just spaced everybody out, sanitize, wear your mask all that stuff. Um, And people were just so thankful for it. Um, And then, yeah, and then we just started doing online sales and people picking up at the farm and we were just like, man, wish I'd have thought about this earlier. So, um, so yeah. And so that's, you know, maintained um, as, and, you know, as a a key part of my sales outlet Um, and, and restaurant and wholesale has become less and less, you know, I just kind of, keep relationships with like one or two restaurants. Cause I mean, you know, I like the chef, I like what they're doing. It's good, but it's not like, you know, it's not a big um, percentage of the sales. Um, Cause right now, you know, we're just trying to maximize retail opportunities. And I would assume that your um, demand out, you know, strips your supply. Is that correct? I mean, you probably have plenty of demand just with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There is plenty of demand, and it's weird. It's cyclical because um, the winter is 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 tough because you don't really think of Georgia as being like, ooh, cold. <laughs> people don't go outside, but as it dips below cold, b- below fifty, and people are like it's freezing, and so less people do shop during the winter, um, which is crazy. And then you know, also the, the variety does get like less, so. Um, so wintertime definitely gets a little bit more challenging in terms of like, you know, we've gotten better at growing in the winter and growing more, you know, because of the tunnels and, and everything like that. Um, and so it is like a little bit more supply than you have demand during the winter. But then the rest of the year, it is it's pretty robust. Um, and it's just trying to trying to keep up with that demand. Um, and, I, you know, I'm limited. I'm, I have an acre and a half. That's it. And I'm. I have no dreams of getting any bigger. It's enough. It's a lot. And um, the only thing that, you know, we aim for is just to kind of be more efficient. I know we can kind of like, we can produce more out of that space. We can be more efficient with our operation. Um, And um, and yeah, you know, that's kind of what we're aiming for. 
It's just more efficiency and, uh, you know, just better systems to manage our workflow, make sure we're not wearing ourselves out. I'm in my 40s, 43. My um, farm manager, he's 48. He's been in farming a long time, so he already has a couple of, I think guys are just harder <laughs> on their bodies than women. I mean, you know, they just can throw themselves at I'm like, just calm down. <laughs> um, so I got a few more aches and pains. So I'm constantly trying to make sure that the farm grows in a way that we can grow with it and not wear ourselves out farming it. You mentioned you have uh, some, you have children? I do. I have three boys. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um how how old are they and have they expressed interest in, you know, I guess, depending on how old they are and taking over? Yeah. So, yeah, when I started really kind of especially like when I started the farm at the school, they were five, seven and nine. So, yeah, they were helping me on the farm. You know, they was at the farmer's market. I mean, you know, we all have, you know, our farmer market babies that, you know, they was with us. We see People's families grow up and um, they are all off to college. You know, I've just got one son left with me here at home and he's going into culinary. He's going to culinary school. So he's always been into food. Um, So they have done their fair share (laughs) of farming. And, you know, we live in the city. Right. And so pretty much kind of when they got to high school, you know, I'm like, I'm not going (laughs) to force you to like do farm stuff. Right. You know, you go, you have your high school, city, college, you know, city, city kid experience and, and all of that. So there's not a, you know, it's not a, um, like a requirement, like y'all have to help me on the farm or anything like that. So I just, you know, I'll let it be up to them when, you know, they show interest and want to come, come back to it, but they definitely, they put in the work. And, you know, and if I need help with anything major, they're like, mommy, you know, I got you. I'll come help you out with stuff. So they're pretty cool. But yeah, they're all on their own journeys yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah, no, that's important. Yeah. And yeah, and ages, let me see, ages 23, 21, and 19. So. All right. They're older. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it'll be interesting to see what happens, you know, as they continue to age, if, if mm. there is a draw back to, you know, the farm and and how to how to you yeah. know, assist or collaborate with you on that, especially your son who's got mm-hmm. the culinary. Yeah. Who's in food. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, that's great. Well, yeah. you mentioned earlier about uh, a show that you've been doing called Homegrown. And I'd love to hear a little mm-hmm. bit more about how that came about and the inspiration for that mm-hmm. and how that's going for you. Today's episode is brought to you by Rimmel Greenhouses. Whether it's tomatoes to market, flowers in the spring, or your family's harvest, Growing in a greenhouse protected from the weather provides the right environment that you need for a harvest that you can count on. Rimmel greenhouses are designed for durability and offer the quality that you need to grow productively year-round. Visit RimmelGreenhouses.com to get a quote today. If I may editorialize for a second, I own a Rimmel tunnel. I love it. We built it ourselves and I really appreciated the quality of the tunnel as well as the customer service we received in the process. So make sure to check them out. Today's episode is also brought to you by Johnny's Selected Seeds. Since 1973, Johnny's has supported farmers and gardeners with superior seeds, tools, and information to help ensure their growing success and help feed their communities and families. The research farm is at the heart of Johnny's, where they trial thousands of varieties and tools every year. Their breeding program uniquely focuses on introducing varieties that meet the needs or solve the challenges mixed market, small farmers, and avid gardeners face. Visit johnnyseeds.com for innovative new varieties and time-tested favorites to grow this season. You can also browse their online growers library, link in the description, for a wealth of free educational resources. The employee owners at Johnny's look forward to growing with you. All right, back to the show. Yeah, yeah. So Homegrown started off during COVID. It's funny. I got an email from a production company here in Atlanta. Um, in 2019, I can't remember, was it February of 2019 or something like that? And they were like, Hey, we are trying to do a show about, you know, local farmer and or our farms show. And we're trying to do this pitch to a network that we hear is coming out. And, um, and we found you and we would love to have you come in and just, you know, talk to us. And it's interesting because they were like the third production company that had reached out to me 
in a span of maybe like six months trying to do something around German. Um, but they were the only one in Atlanta. The others were like, one was in California and one was somewhere else. And they were kind of trying to go a different angle, more like reality <laughs> drama, TV drama on the farm. And I'm like, what? the Atlanta farming community is one big happy family <laughs> and we love each other and support each other. And they just were like, so nobody has problems with each other. I'm like, you know. They always Anywho. want the drama, right? Because um, the drama sells. They want the <laughs> drama. I'm like, well, the earth's giving us a lot of drama. This climate change, is that drama enough? I mean, these bugs are getting on my nerves. Um, <laughs> oh, we want drama. But so I could see where they were leaning. Like, I don't, I'm not interested in that. It's farming hard enough. Um, so anyway, so yeah, they were here in Atlanta. They were like 15 minutes from my house. So I was like, okay, let me go see what they're talking about. Um, and, you know, went in, met with them, really cool people, just really nice. She was like, do you mind if I just kind of like do a little video? So she got a little iPhone out and, you know, just answer some questions. They had already done a whole write-up, you know, they'd already like written up the pitch to the show. Um, and she was like, okay, um, we're going to send this off. And then we literally, we, they, we just sent off the, the proposal, you know, to, at that time, um, before it launched, you know, Magnolia Network, she, you know, she's in production. She knew that they were getting ready to launch a network and looking for content and sent it off. And then, you know, they approved it and they were like, okay, yeah. So they funded the pilot and, um, and now here we are getting ready to launch season three in April of this year. And it's just been really cool. And what, what I liked about the opportunity was, I guess at this point, I was already nine years into my farming, you know, um, journey. And I was already getting tons of people reaching out. Oh, my God, my family's got land over here. People just, you know, wanting help. They want direction. People, you know, having their own gardens. Like so many people just want information on how to grow food, what to do, this, this, that, and the other. And in talking to them about kind of what they wanted for the show and knowing what Magnolia Network really is about. You know, they're really about like information that people can really actually ingest, use and have successful. It was like, okay, here's an opportunity to really share real information to um, kind of like show people how something is done and then really have them have information that they can take away and implement. So I was like, it was just a learning. It was an opportunity to teach on a scale that I could not do just on my own. So I was like, okay, you know, yeah, I can, I can get behind this, um, this uh, project and be part of it. And that was homegrown, you know, and uh, it's been really good. And ch- it was challenging the first year running a farm because at that time I was really the farm manager and I was like, you know, running the farm day to day. And um, I just kind of had an inexperienced crew, but, you know, um, I just had to, the following year, I was like, okay, I got to bring somebody in that has a lot more experience and I can feel comfortable running the farm in my absence. Cause once filming happens, it just gets real busy and I'm just not there every day to be able to check in. So the the show is available to view on HBO Max. Yeah, it's on Discovery Plus, which is a streaming platform. Um, it's on HBO, so they, and they also distribute on HBO Max and of course Magnolia Network as well. And I've I've uh, watched a number of the episodes, and um, for listeners, the concept is you have a family, you go and look at their backyard, and you're basically sort of designing and installing uh, gardens for them to, to grow in and produce their own food. Mm-hmm. Um, is that, is that, is that, am I understanding that correctly? That's it. That's the premise of the show. Um, yep. You know, we go and help families um, create spaces to kind of grow their own, to, not kind of, to grow their own food. Um, and I don't know if you started any of season two, because season one, it was six episodes. And when we filmed, we just essentially filmed the install and the big sort of finale day was when we kind of planted everything and, and judged it all up, you know? And so you kind of got to see it. Um, and then by the time we got into season two, we extended filming into, you know, the install planting. And then we came back two months later so you can see how the garden has grown and you kind of m- see more of a harvest. Um, so it had a bigger kind of like garden, like, okay. And that way we can talk about harvesting. Cause the other thing we realized in working with families on season one is like, people were like, 
So what do we harvest? Like what, <laughs> what do I do now? <laughs> like uh, when the tomatoes are red, like when the cucumbers are green, like people literally were like, and also they were kind of overwhelmed because I don't think people understand. Like they ask for, and we try to tell them we're like, this is a lot of garden that you're asking for. And they're like, no, 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 I want it. I grew up with this. I used to be with my grandparents. We're like, okay. <laughs> and then it comes in and they're like, wow, um, this is a lot of food when do I pick my green beans? And so it was like, okay, we need to make sure people know when to harvest things and also to help problem solve any issues as well. You know, if there's pest damage or is it time to take this out or can I put something else in or, you know, things like that. So. And then are there any um, lessons learned for season three that, that happened during filming? What, what is there any differences there? Uh, not too, too, no. I think the only thing is that we're just trying to kind of bring in more mm. animals. So I'm trying to think season. Did we do? I think maybe we just did chickens and we brought in some animals to kind of, I think we had some goats that did like clearing, things like that. So season three, we have some families that have like, they're bringing on animals onto their farm spaces. And that's really cool. So, uh, you know, people love animals, love farm animals. Yes. <laughs> yes. Great so. for bringing in viewers too, I'm sure. <laughs> Exa- right. Great for bringing in viewers. And, you know, and then we're just trying to get more sort of what people consider kind of authentic farm content, you know, um, because, you know, it can all, it can all be like raised beds in a back, you know, backyard, right. You know, um, so which meant we traveled a little bit further outside of Atlanta, you know, to kind of get those people that, can support livestock. I mean, because you need a diff, you know, you need more space. You need way more space uh, to be able to, you know, do livestock well. So, yeah. Well, I've only watched season one so far, but my favorite episode was the one where you actually were helping them to understand about winter production. So I thought that mm-hmm. was very fitting because uh, you were helping to describe the crops that could get through. Georgia winters yeah. and you know how mm-hmm. to protect them using low tunnels. So it was really yep. great that you brought that content into the that episode. Yeah, yeah, you know, we definitely try to film in a way where we kind of touch on every season so people kind of get a sense for you know what can grow in each season and also that yeah, in Georgia you can get, you know, you can grow through the winter, you know, with some protection, you know, some things don't really need it. Now this day need everybody's gonna need protection (laughs) but um yeah and so um you know so that was really that was really good to kind of be able to have that opportunity but yeah we try to film because we're filming all year long you know what i mean because i mean it takes a while to like we we actually you know we do all the work and um you know some people's projects you know we had one family's project literally took us the whole year last year just because of where they were, they had a lot going on. It was a bigger space. Um, some projects take three months, some projects take six months. So we're really kind of like the whole time with all those families um managing that. So um we may slate our family for spring and then end up being like, okay, we're we missed that window. <laughs> so we might be doing, you know, a fall garden with you or something like that. Cause that's the other thing, is like it's it's real, you know, we can't. Because we're documenting the reality, we we can't fake it. No. <laughs> um, yeah, we we can't. You know, I'm like, I can't. I can't buy big plants. Like, we can't go to a farm and snatch up some big, you know, mature tomato plants and say like it. It just doesn't work, guys. I'm like, so we just missed that. <laughs> so that's the other thing. It's like really kind of like educating the crew and the network on sort of like how production can happen on a farm in real time if you're trying to catch you know like we're trying to capture the reality and you know it's like we don't want it like you know just like put a tomato in today and all of a sudden you know you cut to a full-grown tomato in two weeks like yeah no we're not doing that so yeah keeping it real so yeah no, that's so important because I mean, so often, you know, when I watch any kind of show, you know, from with the eyes of a farmer, I'm like, wait a second, <laughs> they just they just like manufactured that, <laughs> yeah, and it has yeah. no basis in reality, you know. Yeah. And if you know that, you know, you're gonna see mm-hmm. that. But if you don't, then you're just gonna mislead people, right? So 
how you're going to mislead people. And then people are like, hey, I tried that <laughs> and it didn't work. Like, I'm like, it's my reputation. I can tell them all that. I'm like, I'm a farmer in real life. Okay. I got my reputation to like <laughs> uphold. You know, I don't want people to come back and be like, Jamal has given me false information. But really, we've been getting a lot of great feedback. People are like, oh my God, I tried that and that was great. Or there's so much I didn't know. Or, you know, I'm definitely going to, you know, do things a little bit different. So, um, you know, it's working in the way we wanted it to work. And that's very rewarding. Yeah. Well, I think it's a great show and I hope that listeners check it out. So it's, um, yes, check it out. You're a great host too. You're fun to watch. So, (laughs) you know, never in a million years would I or anybody like growing up high school, college be like, yeah, Jamal will be on TV. (laughs) You know, but it's so funny. I told people, I was like, you know, I'm, I'm always like, no, no, I'm good. I'm no, I'm not doing anything. And I literally was like, you know, 2020, you know, we all thought 2020 was just like this magical number. All the great things were going to happen. Everybody had all kinds of hopes and dreams. And I was like, 2020 is going to be my year of yes. (laughs) Boy, did I say yes. And yeah. And I was like, yeah, I'll do it. And I'm like, oh, my God, didn't think this is what that was going to be. But it's been good. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Well, circling back to earlier when we we're talking about, um, you know, the event you experienced with the weather this mm-hmm. January and how there's not much you can do in the moment. What are you now thinking about uh, for the future of the farm for how you can help prepare for things like that? Yeah, no, I'm thinking about, I think, some forced heating. Some like I'm thinking like, um, you know, is that something like you know, what does it look like to add some supplemental heat into the tunnels? Um, and then also, yeah, you know, like I said, the varieties that made it, you're like, okay, more of that. And really being specific about crop varieties that can handle, you know, that kind of cold. I mean, I think that's about it. Um, more tunnels, I don't know, because of the way I built out the rest of the farm. But yeah, I think it's more like with the tunnels that we have, how can we add some heat into that? And then also making sure we're selecting varieties of crops for the winter that can handle like that kind of freeze. I mean, I think that's that's the pivot right now that I've come up with. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and always more kale, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like like I said, the curly <laughs> kale did well. And so it's like, OK, I know I've grown um, a couple of, you know, so like, OK, really look at more purple um purple lettuce varieties spinach was like i'll live for this yes. you know <laughs> spinach was all about it um and like i said the strawberries were great the leeks were good and also kind of like um no the the loss of kale did not the rainbow char was like no um but um you know probably can have certain things in earlier and probably they would have been able to withstand so maybe um the cabbages and the broccolis and things uh, maybe can withstand if they had gone in early and maybe been a little bit bigger. So, you know, just things like that. Um, But yeah, you know, it'd be interesting because, I mean, we do still as a farming community, you know, we haven't gotten an opportunity to kind of get our breath and come together just and just, you know, talk to each other and be like, all right, who made it? And then also like my carrots and stuff like that, you know, carrots, beets. Um, I did see with other farmers, their carrots and beets survived. And I think theirs were just in earlier and they were bigger. And so they could withstand mine were, you know, not that big. So, yeah. So it's just like timing, making sure I get it in, in the right time, picking the right varieties for that can handle that cold and um, thinking about some, some supplemental heated for those, those tunnels. Yeah. Well, there's, I mean, there's just so many things. A lot of it is experimentation and you just unfortunately have to Mm -hmm. keep trying, you know, not everyone is going to have, you know, the perfect solution or recommendation. Mm -hmm. A lot of it is observational. Yeah. Yeah. And I've seen, you know, I saw some, some of the farmers were able to do low tunnels in the high tunnels. Mm -hmm. Um, so it looked like that was successful for some people. But then, you know, like that farm that did that, she was a little bit further south. She's like an hour and a half, two hours south. So a couple of degrees warmer. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and then, and then my, my farm is also, you know, you have microclimates even within, yep. right? So 
where the main farm site is, you know, the acre and a half collective, that is in a bowl. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it's cooler than the second farm site that I have around the corner. You know, the elevation change is significant. It's actually on what is called Bush Mountain, which is a, um, it's a kind of low, low mini mountain in the neighborhood that's on this 26 acre nature preserve. And so at the top there, um, that is usually two, three degrees warmer. Um, and so that could have been, you know, enough of a buffer probably if I had some things up there because I've had things freeze at the main site that didn't freeze at that site. Even when we have like, you know, 20 something degrees, 30 something degrees, you know? Um, so I've noticed just between those two sites, there's enough of a temperature difference. So being like, okay, let me see, where do I put what, where? Yeah. Yeah. And those, those inner layers in the tunnels, they really make a difference too. We use them, you know, in any unheated mm -hmm. tunnel up here in Maine. And I'll actually okay. share with you the, the funny story is that my dad always likes to talk about, you know, the layers of protection and how it brings you one and one half zones further south. So, you know, mm -hmm. the plastic layer is brings you one and one half zone further south. And then the inner layer mm -hmm. underneath that another one mm -hmm. and one half zone. So you're three zones further south. So we always like to say yeah. here in Maine, you go from Maine outside the high tunnel to Georgia mm -hmm. <laughs> underneath the, the low tunnel. So that's our winter is <laughs> your, your Georgian winter is what's underneath yeah. our, our low tunnel. So. And what, um, what, um, I guess, weight fabric do you use inside for the low tunnel inside the tunnel? Yep. So uh, the Agrabon 30 or, you know, 19, okay. kind of depending which crop it is, like for, for spinach, we'll use 19 mm -hmm. because it can take yeah. anything, but um, 30 mm -hmm. for most other crops okay. and then multiple layers, depending on how cold it gets. So, mm. so that's another thing, but it's a lot of management. I mean, we, ha you know, it's it's like, so it's much all, management. I'm like the, the schlepping <laughs> of the fabric and, the, and do you just put it like in the tunnel, you put it just on the, or are you doing hoops as well? We do hoops most of the times because it protects the crop from having, you know, cosmetic yeah. um, damage, mm -hmm. but, uh, but spinach can take it directly on top of the crop oftentimes. So it, yeah. 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 But yeah, the spinach was in the in the caterpillar tunnel. That spinach was like we're good. It was fine. It's in the caterpillar tunnel, and then um, it's I have raised wooden raised beds in the tunnel, so it's like forty feet long wooden raised beds in the tunnel. And the reason I went to wooden raised beds, and I'm transitioning a lot of the farm to that because because we're in the city, so many people want to come visit the farm, yeah. and so kind of like another layer of revenue that we're gonna you know be kind of jumping into more is like tours, which the farmers were like. We're not doing that. We're just gonna hire somebody to manage that. Cause it's like I'm running the farm. Somebody else can like be all peppy and happy and you know, lead people around. Um, but with that, you know, I had done tours in the past before, and it's just like you you just, you know, the anxiety you have with like trying to keep people on a walkway and not stepping in your beds. So I'm like, if we're gonna be doing having more people coming to the farm, visiting the farm, seeing, you know, all up in there, like we just need. We need an edge, a hard edge. Um, and, um, you know, and it's it's been really good in that way. Um, and just and also like it just makes it easier, you know, when we're out there and just sit on the edge of the bed and do stuff. It's been night and day in terms of like the effect on my body yeah. working out of a raised bed than working straight out the ground because, <laughs> um, you know, we don't do a lot of machinery. Um, if we need a BCS, we'll rent it from a local tube bank. Um, don't have a tractor. I'll till the field um, and have a friend that has a tractor who will come out and till the one field that we have. Um, like, I need to call him now to come and kind of prep that area, get all the spring beds put in. I mean, all the beds put in, and then that's it for the year. Um, and then sometimes we don't even do that every year. Sometimes I'll just leave the beds and just sort of refresh them. And then, depending on how crazy the summer got, we might retail the whole thing, but, but yeah, it's, you know, it's all hand work. Yeah. It's all people, people powered. <laughs> so mm -hmm. if you've got tours coming, anything else you envision for the future of the farm? 
oh yeah, I'm working on a really big project right now for the vision for the farm. And that's, it's just been really good to have purchased this property because now I can dream a lot bigger. I can invest. And so I'm really working on this three-part robust vision for the farm where it's really going to take it from just being a working farm to kind of like a really hands-on community engaged kind of wellness retreat agritourism kind of space so better farm headquarters and then we want to build a big kind of multi-use um building that where we can we'll have um uh, a commercial kitchen in there to do value added stuff, but also be able to host farm dinners, things like that. Um, a multi-use space to be able to do, you know, cooking classes, you know, I don't know if you want to look, um, make soap with farm product. If you want to make, you know, different things like that, um, somebody wants to do yoga classes. Um, so we'll have that. And then we're going to have, um, there's a part of the farm that of the site that we don't farm on is kind of like on the other side of the creek and it backs up to a 14 acre just kind of like preserve area that the city has and um on that side we want to do some hospitality um opportunities so people can come stay on the farm you know experience it you know through a weekend or during the week or something like that so want to bring all that in so that we just add another layer of revenue. So it's not just vegetables and us like, you know, being stressed every year about just, you know, cause that kind of loss, even though with the community, I mean, we raised like a little over $10,000 and that was great. It definitely doesn't account for what we lost in, you know, crop value, you know? And so it just, it's just been able to like, you know, keep employees employed, you know, clean up the farm, kind of get things going. I was like, it's giving me a lot of opportunity to like judge the farm up because <laughs> we're not like harvested and going about like, okay, we can kind of clean some things that we've been ignoring. So we've been knocking out like really big farm tours that just keep getting pushed off because you're so busy farming. Um, and so, yeah, and so that's the vision for that. And we went through zoning and took us six months to get our zoning approval just for the plan. Um, I'm halfway done with all of the design work with the architects and engineers, and um, we're getting ready to embark on a major capital campaign to, you know, to kind of build it out. So that's where we are. Well, that sounds really exciting and so important that, you know, you have to build in that resiliency. And obviously, Mm -hmm. it sounds like what you're planning will help the farm have more resiliency. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, and and it's just like in talking to other farmers, you know, we're realizing like, it's just not enough to just grow produce and sell produce. You know, we, we need something else, you know, whether you're like, you know, my thing, you know, I'm going to be doing value added or I'm going to be doing, you know, other things like it, it, it's like, we need something else, you know, to be able to like build in that resiliency and then, you know, be able to provide, you know, more than just a job, right. To, the people that work for you, be able to, you know, have benefits and, you know, pay for vacations and, you know, like, I don't know, like if we can get a retirement, you know, pay into a retirement plan and fund for farmers, that would be, you know, that would be great. And for the people that are working for me. So I'm just thinking, you know, we want to do this, you know, and, you know, we want to be able to retire from it. And I see a lot of farmers, a lot of older farmers that I've met. And, you know, the sad thing that it's like, they're just like, can't retire from the farm because you know it's just the the the, you know the money's just not there for them to retire um and they just have to keep working the farm and you're like and they're older you know and um so yeah you know thinking about that now you know we got we got 20 more good years of farming in us Yeah. Well, right. And I want it to be enjoyable. (laughs) I want it to, you know, I want us to be able to take time off and, and I like definitely build in time off. I'm like, could we operate? Like, you know, I'm not going to be like eking out 100% productivity, like at what cost, like winter time, we take time off. Like we all take up to two weeks at some point staggered through the winter because, you know, we're down to one market. It's not that, you know, we're not selling that that much in the winter. So, you know, one person, two people can kind of manage it. Somebody, you know, goes take some time off, be with family, 
come back. And, you know, we're doing that now. But I just want to, you know, I just want to have more. Yeah. No, I, I mean, rightly so. And um, I'm I'm really happy to hear of of this earlier <laughs> visioning that you're trying to do now because so many farmers, you know, get they just get so caught up in the work that they don't think about these things until it's too late. Right. Yeah. So it's great that you're yeah. being intentional about it now. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I've, I've, you know, like the first four or five years on my farm, I was still an engineer. So I've definitely been able to sort of build it without it necessarily being the only thing that I depended on. Cause I think if it was just from the beginning, only the farm, and that was the, my only source of income, I, I, you don't, you don't have a moment to think about anything else. Yeah. You know what I mean? Cause it's just, it's that consuming. Um, so I've been able to just kind of like keep reinvesting into the farm, keep reinvesting into the farm, getting, you know, little pieces of infrastructure here and there. Um, and then being able to get some nonprofit funding that has helped kind of like vision for the next level. So we got um, a good, a significant investment from uh, the American Heart Association that's helped with this sort of visioning for the next level because, oh my God, (laughs) building anything, my goodness, just like, you know, getting the permit in and everything like that, you know, you've got to get professionals to do the work and submit the plans and you got to pay those people. Of course you should pay those people. And that's not inexpensive work. I mean, it's, significant amount of money to spend to even put together the vision before you can even build it. So, um, just, yeah, I know I was like, Ooh, got to figure out how to make this happen, you know? And so just got to stick to it. I'm a Taurus. So, you know, I'm gonna figure it out. I'm a bull. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're like, I know, I'm kind of like, it's so funny. I know a lot of farmers, um, who we all like have, like, if we're like, uh, birthday twins so we all have birthdays like eight, i'm april 27th another farmer friend of mine he's 27th i had a guy that was working for me he was like april 26th somebody was a 25th like we're all like bull you know <laughs> we are like third signs we are getting it done um so i find that really interesting yeah yeah well good um well i think it's time to jump into the lightning round so are you ready for those questions i'm ready good number one uh favorite crop to grow cook or eat oh okay so you know i can't pick one but things i super love i love growing root crops just because i feel like i'm pulling out candy out the ground every time they're so pretty so you know carrots radishes turnips um my family's Caribbean, so we love okra. And just recently, um, last year, I started growing um, kalaloo, which is a Caribbean spinach. Um, it's a summer green <laughs> thing, grows like a tree in the summertime. So that's been super rewarding, and I'm going to keep growing that. So that's my answer. Yeah. And then w- what about to eat? What was your favorite to eat? Uh, eat? Oh, I love okra. I love okra. I mean, I, I eat everything, but um, but I do love, love, love okra. I turn a lot of people onto okra that say they don't like okra, <laughs> and I get them to eat it raw, and then they love it. <laughs> What's your favorite tool? My favorite tool is a uh, Stirapo. Um, I can't remember what brand was that. I, I yeah, because we you know we do a lot of just you know we work with a lot of hand tools on the farm, and that one's just sort of like all purpose for weeding, for just kind of like, you know, loosening up the top couple of inches of soil and raised bed. I love a good stir up hoe and we have them in different widths, um, just depending on what we're doing. What's your favorite way to relax or self-care activity or how do you take care of your body, heart and mind as a farmer? Mm, I really got into yoga heavily. Once I got into farming, I was like, oh, my God. Um, I also there's a, a, a Korean spot here in just outside of Atlanta. And um, I usually go quarterly and I have literally given my farmers um, gift cards for them to go quarterly as well. <laughs> to the, and it's like a 24 hour spa with hot tubs and all kinds of, you know, steam rooms, saunas, jade rooms, all that stuff. So that's amazing. Uh, and then, yeah, travel here and there. 
Yeah, I love how you you are you really get the self care part, and you're actually doing the actions that yeah <laughs> that take care I of have yourself. To. I mean, yeah. Oh my God, you got to. You know what I mean? Because it's like you know your back. You know, it's so much bending over, so much you know, lifting heavy things. And I mean, you know, I'm in a city, so a lot of it is, it is accessible. Like, you know, there's a lot of benefits to being so close to, you know, an urban, I can, I can go to a yoga class. Like I go after, after the farm, I'm like running yoga close to the studio, you know? So, um, things like that is easy. And then, you know, like I said, once a quarter, we'll go to, you know, the, the, the spot. Cause it's a trek. It's like 45 minutes, but then you get to just like chill all day. I'm like, go get it, farmers. <laughs> Such a difference. <laughs> mm -hmm. What's your favorite smell and your least favorite smell on the farm? You know what? It's hard to say what the favorite smell is, but I know what my least favorite smell is. Um, oh my God, anything in that tomato, potato, rotten tomato, <laughs> potato, eggplant. Oh my God. I have a love-hate relationship with tomatoes. I do love when I'm like, messing with tomatoes like when you're like putting them and you're just like oh that tomato smell but like oh my god rotten tomatoes <laughs> rotten potatoes it's horrible <laughs> it's worse than fish emulsion <laughs> and and any any a couple of your favorites i mean favorite it's so weird i don't like i just remember smells i don't like i mean i don't really grow flowers but obviously i love the smell of flowers um i mean good compost yeah, that's a good one. I think it's oh, the first. You know what? I know what's a really good smell. And this only happens like at a certain time of the year. Like um, here in Atlanta, like Home Depot will do one for the chipper. So after Christmas, they'll have everybody bring their Christmas trees and they'll chip it up at the Home Depots. And then they call all the local farms and they drop off the, the mulch. And oh, my God. <laughs> That you smell Christmas for months and that pile is just breaking down. Oh, and it smells so good. I love that. That's a good one, too. <laughs> oh, my God. I missed the drop off last year and I was very sad about it. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> what do you love besides farming? Um, Love besides farming. Eating food, cooking food with friends. I love traveling. Um, So I go somewhere international every year. And um, dancing. Love to dance. What kind of dance? All. Just, I think anything movement. Like, you know, I literally, I mean, I'll go out. I mean, it doesn't matter what the music is. It could be salsa. It could be drum and bass. It could be hip hop. It could be like, you know, Afro beat. Like, I am, I love a good body jiggle moment <laughs> <laughs> love to dance grew up dancing makes you feel good <laughs> an inspiring farmer or land steward you'd want to have as a dinner guest either living or deceased yeah deceased i thought about it so i was like uh, george washington carver you know um he was a black agriculturalist and i mean like just all the work that he's done to just you know um contribute to sustainable ag it's just like and he was a, he was a, he was a painter. He just seemed like just an all around beautiful, amazing soul and um, just contributed a lot to what we're doing now. So like, that would be a really, you know, especially growing in the South, you know, like heritage wise, my family's from the Caribbeans, but just like steward and land in the South um, and knowing his impact on Southern ag and just like sustainable ag in general. George Washington Carver. Yeah, good one. What would you feed him? Oh my God. Oh, ooh. <laughs> what would I feed him? I don't know. Definitely something okra. <laughs> That's what I thought. <laughs> uh, I mean, def definitely. Like, I mean, I just love okra, right? What would I feed? Lord have mercy. You that was not on. I know. I think <laughs> about question. that. Like, what? <laughs> Whatever he wanted. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> uh, okay. Next one. What would you be doing if you weren't farming? Hmm. I probably would still have continued in engineering in some way, but definitely pivoted. I think. But then I also think like, ooh, would I have just? Yeah, yeah. I probably would have continued in engineering in some way. Cause I do, I do love engineering. I just didn't like 
what I was doing in engineering at the time, engineering, consulting. Mm -hmm. What's one piece of advice that you wish you had starting out or something you wish you had done differently? Um, Even though I was well-read, it would have been good if I had had some hands-on experience at a production firm before I started. So everything I learned, I learned on the job, as they say. Yeah. Um, And I mean, I just didn't really have the luxury to be able to do that. I was a a mom with children, with a career already. You know, I couldn't just go off and be like, I'm going off, you know, for two years to somebody's farm. Um, But when people come and ask me, you know, they're starting off, I'm like, go and, you know, go and work for some years somewhere. So you can know the cadence, you can know what's involved, you can see what a farm is like through all of the seasons, get all of the struggles, all of the, you know, you can really know. And then also you get a sense for like systems and how those systems work or don't work or whatever. Um, So I spend a lot of time researching and learning and asking and, you know, and all of that and learning, you know, which is constant. Get some experience, people. Yes. <laughs> no, I was wondering, is there a particular farm that you know of um, today that you would, if, you know, your younger you had had the opportunity to work there that you would like to work at? What would be a recommendation of a farm to some young farmer? I mean, here in Atlanta, you know, some of the some of the kind of like farms that have been around for a while here, there's like Woodland Gardens out in Athens. They are a farm that's been around for a minute that um, I'm trying to think because, you know, kind of when we when I started, a lot of us were started, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think who else was kind of a big farm at that time. Um, you know, Serenby is a farm that a lot of people, um, have kind of, you know, like not really an incubator farm, but you can, you can go cut your teeth as a farmer out there. Definitely. Um, production at the time, I think Daniel Pearson does a farm out at Oglethorpe. It's at a university, but he was a production farmer before he joined the university. So he really kind of brings that lens to it where you can like really learn. So if you're able to like go to school, but you're kind of on a production farm, that would be a good one to go to. And hopefully maybe your farm yeah, as well. (laughs) Oh, you know, we're getting there. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, yeah. You know, yeah. Yeah, (laughs) because actually I'm going to be hiring for two people like very soon. I'm like, I need to go ahead and put it out there. I need to uh, bring on some more people. But yeah, yeah, because yeah. we're 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 year round. We go to market, and you know, you come on the farm, you do everything. Yeah, you know, um, some people kind of really differentiate. They have certain people that go to market, certain people that work on the farm. I'm like, nope. Everybody gets to do everything, and everybody gets to learn everything. Because you know, I, a lot of the people I meet on my journey, even in employment, you know, they have a vision to have their own space. So I'm like, well, you're gonna get your hands in everything so you know the whole thing because you can't be a great farmer and then bad at the market you can't be like oh i'm great you know i love talking to people but ooh, you know this farm work <laughs> it's got to be everything so yeah what is uh what do you feel is your gift to give on behalf of people and the land um my gift to give um you know i was thinking just sort of Visibility in Harmon as a person of color, as um, as a woman, as a mother, as, um, you know, not your typical, what people would consider to be a farmer, just kind of like really bringing that to the table and just, um, you know, really showing people that, you know, it is possible. You know, it's possible. It's a lot of hard work. Um, but that, you know, farming is not something that only a certain group of people get to do. And, and traveling internationally has definitely also opened my eyes to just sort of most farm work is done by women globally, (laughs) you know what I mean? And so, you know, it's, it's a very patriarchal industry here in the States, but on a global scale, it's not. 
Um, but then, and also getting an opportunity to talk to farmers and other communities. We also have, we do respect the industry a lot more here in this country than people do in other places. Um, so, you know, there are pluses and minuses, but that, you know, it's possible and that, um, you know, I am just one of many, you know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, somebody special or like just this one per, oh my God, Jamila, like you're the only black female farmer. No, I'm not. I am part of a long legacy of people that have been doing it for a long time. There's a lot of other black farmers out there um, and just sort of bringing visibility to that and, um, and uplifting those stories and that history and that culture and that knowledge. And, um, you know, I hope to just, you know, be part of the ocean of all the people that are just, you know, doing this great work. Well, thank you for being here. I feel very, very honored to be able to hear what you have to share and witness the work that you do. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Um, it's a great conversation. Well, hold on. One final question. How okay, we got more. Okay. Last one. <laughs> and it's a fitting one. How will you grow old farming? Oh, how will I grow old farming comfortably? <laughs> <laughs> um, I cannot imagine that I wouldn't be doing it in some way. Um, I know I want to kind of like, I definitely want to, I know I want to kind of go overseas. I want to go back to you know, my family's land in Jamaica. My dad's got land in Trinidad. My mom, my family's got land in Jamaica. I know I want to do stuff there. So, you know, you know, I wouldn't mind sort of like kind of completing this farm project and getting it to a place where it can kind of operate, you know, get a manager and have a staff and people are running this and I go and, you know, start some other projects somewhere else. Um, and just, you know, help to just steward spaces in multiple places. It kind of rhymed. <laughs> steward spaces in multiple places. I love that. Uh, well, it sounds like a great, great way to to grow old farming. Yeah. And just go visit other farms and chill with them. Because, I mean, that's what I do when I travel anyways. I'm always like, let's go to the farmer's market. If there's a farm nearby, let's go visit a farm. You know, like. It's a curse, isn't it? Right? No, you can't go anywhere without wanting to go visit a farmer or a farm. Yeah, you know, like how does it look in your country? What are they doing over there? You know, it's it's not blue. We love it. You know, love it. I, I can't get away from it. <laughs> Well, good. Well, thank you, Jamila, so much. It's been a pleasure to talk with you today and thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks for having me. This was a great conversation and uh, yeah, I look forward to the final. <laughs> great. Well, happy spring. Happy spring to you too.